Right guys, uh, Mr. Pope from Wilmington Grammar School for Boys and today we're going to be looking at correlation and linear regression um, in the statistics part of my videos. Um, now there's quite a lot to cover here today and you're going to have to just, um, hopefully I'm going to explain this as best as I can. Uh, there's quite a fair bit that you just, I assume you have to know. Um, and if you follow, then, you know, that's even great, even better. So, first of all, um, let's suppose I've got a data set. Um, so, I don't know, say I'm interested um, in, let's say, um, X is the height in centimeters of people and let's say y is a hand span in centimeters okay so let's suppose you've taken a bunch of data uh, from I don't know 20 or 30 people some finite amount it doesn't matter about the size particularly so much um, this is the independent okay also known as the explanatory uh, variable or control variable and the y variable would be the dependent variable because it depends on the x um, you know uh, so what I'm trying to say is that when you've got a data set you usually have um, if it's if it's not one variable it's a two variable um, data set i.e. there's two things you're measuring. So say for example um, we take 50 people and we measure their height and their hand span and this is one variable height and another variable hand span and we have this idea maybe in our minds that the hand span would depend on the height. Now, you, there is arguments actually put the other way around and say the height might depend on hand span. Um, but the natural assumption for this case would just be height is the independent variable. Um, so, what's happening here? Well, let's suppose I plot a few points. Let's suppose I've got something like this going on. Now, I'm not going to draw 50 people. Draw maybe a few like that maybe and what this denotes is that at any point let's take this one that the x value would give a particular height and the y value would give a hand span in centimeters so if I was to back it up a little bit then this point at the top here would correspond to an incredibly tall person with incredibly large hands and this point down here would correspond to someone with moderate hand size but was quite short. Um, okay, a couple of other representational bits. Let's suppose I include a new point. Let's put it there and I put a ring about it. This point here has coordinates x bar and y bar, where x bar is the mean of all the x coordinates and y bar is the mean of all the y coordinates okay so what are we talking about today well there's two things I want to talk about one is this concept of correlation and we're going to be looking at linear correlation but you may have been experimenting with um, Microsoft Excel, um, Apple's Numbers, uh, various other spreadsheet programs. And you'll find if you tinker around with them long enough, there's not just linear regression lines you can put. You can have um, polynomial, exponential, or other kinds of regression curves. And essentially, a linear correlation is uh, plotting this as y equals some constant 
plus another constant times by x. And what it's trying to do is it's trying to approximate the behavior uh, in the data as a line of best fit. Okay, so, oh, it's not correlation, you silly boy. This is regression. It's a regression. Okay, when we do linear regression um, on some data, we're trying to approximate the data as a line of best fit. So, up until GCC, you might have had to draw a line of best fit, and you'd do it by eyeball, and you go, well, that kind of looks okay, and there's a wide range of error you could be making here. Today, we're actually going to be looking at how to get the, the, the line of best fit, essentially, the linear regression equation, um, by minimizing the errors. And then next thing, uh, I'll get it right this time, correlation, uh, which is usually denoted by this row value, although you may see it as an R value, it doesn't matter. Uh, I'll probably use R. Uh, the long name for what we're going to be looking at today is the product moment uh, correlation coefficient, also abbreviated as PMCC. Um, but now, what this value is, let's change this to pink maybe, what this value is, is the R value can be anywhere up to 1 to negative 1, where R equaling 1 means it's a strong positive correlation. So that means your data sets all lie on a nice straight positive line. Sorry, it's a nice straight line with positive slope. R equals 0 means essentially it's random, or there's no correlation. And r equals to negative 1 means there a strong negative uh, correlation. And what would that look like as a data set? Well, that would be a bunch of points all nicely neat up in a row with negative slope. Uh, it's important to mention that um, this idea of positive correlation doesn't distinguish between a line with gradient like that or a line really steep like that. What it measures is the average distance away from that line and it gives a normalized approximation as to how good the data best approximates that line. For example, if R is 1, that's as best as you can possibly get and all the points lie up on the curve. Whereas if R was something like 0 0.5, then the points would be fairly far away from the line. Might have a couple on it, but on the whole it's quite far away. And if R was 0, it would just look like a cloud of mess and what it means is it's indistinguishable to tell um, whether the slope's positive or negative. So really, there's, these are two powerful bits of statistics uh, that we want to try and get down, i.e., uh, is the data showing some kind of correlation, whether it's positive or negative, and if that's strong enough, is it a good idea to approximate uh, this data using what we're going to be, it was linear regression or uh, least squares uh, regression. Okay, now I could just plod on with the formula, uh, but I want to I want to define a few things first. So let's say there was fifty people. So let n equal fifty here. Now it could be fifty, a hundred doesn't matter, let's get rid of 50, let's just say there's n people. Then clearly, each one of these points is going to be some xi, yi, i.e. there's some countable x's, y's, and so on. What do I mean that? I, I mean that x could belong to the set of, from 1, um, 2, 3, 4, da, 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 up to n minus 1, n. And i is just a counter. So say, for example, I wanted to sum. So let's, let's say I wanted to find the average of x. What would that be? That would be the sum 
of the counter i going from 1 up to n of xi. That just means that this counter i matches this counter. And then once I've taken that sum, I divide all of that by n. And another way of writing that is just saying 1 over n times by the sum of xi, where i goes from 1 up to n. OK, so sigma notation and summation is something you need to get your hang head over. And I'll, I'll be talking through this nice and slow, um, hopefully to be explaining it. And by similar logic, I can then expand and go further and say the mean of y bar is 1 over n of the sum from i is 1 up to n of all the y values. Now that makes sense. The average y value is you sum up all the y values and then divide by n, the number of y values there are. This is just the mean. This is something we've seen before. That should be OK. So this is x bar. And similarly, y bar is down there. OK, now I want to introduce you to another concept, and that is... Um, this idea of s x um, no let's let's call it the error the error or residual now if I'm saying the residual error in x well think about it just like with the standard deviation or the average error the average deviation from it then I want the distance from any x point minus x bar, and I want the sum of that. Okay, and if I want the average distance, then really I square that because I want to make all the distances um, positive, um, and then I divide by the number there are and I square root. Now this residual error we should have also seen is the standard deviation. And I could have done a very similar thing um, with y. For example, the standard deviation of y is just yi minus y bar, squared it, sum those squares up, divide by n to get the average distance squared, and then square root it. Okay, and that will give the average distance away. Now, a couple of things. Um, oh, this is a bit messy. Okay, so what I want to, to do is I want to, before I plod on to how to calculate these things, I want to define a few more things. So let's tidy up and make some space. So this is important. It's taking up too much space. Okay, so this is the standard deviational error. Let's tidy this up. Standard deviation. Okay, and this is it for y. So this is the standard deviation for x. So I won't write it out. I'll just use sigma x, and this is sigma y. Uh, that little o dash thing is sigma. It's like a lowercase, and this capital sigma up here. Um, okay, Greek alphabet, little sidestep. Um, there's upper and lowercase letters. For example, in the alphabet, there's capital A and lowercase a. Uh, in the Greek alphabet, um, rs and little s kind of look like that. But in the Greek alphabet, capital sigma is this like prongy M shape turned 90 degrees anti-clockwise, or an E. And lowercase sigma looks like that. It's kind of like an O with a little quiff thing like that on the right. Some people just draw it straight, some people draw it with a little quiff. It honestly doesn't matter. Um, essentially, little sigma means standard deviation, S for standard, and capital sigma is S for sum. We're summing things up. Um, and notice how uh, I could write my sigma like that, but sometimes when I'm doing it quickly, there's a little bit of a slant on it. But I'm hoping you get that it's the same thing. In actual fact, let's change it. 
Uh, you don't have to. I mean, in, in a rush, you can do something like that, and that's totally fine and acceptable. Um, okay, and, and again, if you haven't put the limits, this is when i goes to 1 up to n, this is when i goes from 1 to n, and so on and so on. Okay, so normally you can just not leave the limits on there. I mean, it's, it's usually inferred in the question, um, but for the majority of this proof, we're just going to be dealing from 1 to n because we're dealing with the sum of all the data points. Okay, so um, let's deal with... Oh, yeah, I was going to define some things first. So let's define, first of all, um, uh, SXX, SYY, and SXY. Okay, now these are going to be the building blocks that I'm going to be showing. Essentially, when I'm talking about um, the regression equation or the correlation equation, I'm just going to go, boom, it's this and they're things you can intuitively pick up. So you can probably spot the pattern here, but sum of xx is going to be the sum of xi squared minus the sum of xi then squared over n. So I want to make two distinctions here. This term says that you take all the x values and square them and then you sum. So for this term, we're squaring first, then summing. And for this term here, we're taking the sum first, and then squaring. So if I, if I give an example of that, let's say my x values are 1, 2, 3, 4. Then the sum of x squared, or xi squared, would be the sum of x, which is 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, then squared. So 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 is 10, 10 squared is 100. If I was to do the sum of x squared, i.e. square it first, then sum it, then I would do 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared plus 4 squared, and that appears to be 30. 4 plus 16 is 20, 9 and 1 is the other 10. Yeah, so... Please be aware of the subtle difference going on here. Um, one is squaring first and summing. The other one is summing first, then squaring. Um, that's just a little example. Um, I'll tell you what, we'll put a bubble around this. And we'll whack this over here as an example, maybe. Okay, next up. Um, what would SYY look like? Well, because uh, these are both X's, these are both Y's, it's going to be the same thing but with Y's now instead. So it's going to be the sum of YI squared minus the sum of YI all squared over N. And S of XY is where we hybrid the both. So it will be the sum of XI times YI minus the sum of xi times the sum of yi and then over n and you're probably thinking okay so what's going on here well this is saying i multiply x and y first and then i sum them and this is saying i take the sum of x and the sum of y and then i multiply so let's take a different example let's say x is one two three four and let's say y is um five six seven eight then the sum of x, i, y, i means you multiply them first. So 1 times 5 is 5, plus 2 times 6 is 12, 3 times 7 is 21, and 4 times 8 is 32. And then I take the sum of all those x times y, so that's 17. Um, but this is 53. 17 plus 53 is 70. And now, if I take the sum of xi and I multiply by the sum of y, then what essentially I'm saying is I sum all of the x's up, um, which is 10, plus I sum all of the y's up, uh, which I want to say is um, 10 plus 16. I want to say that's 26. Uh, double check. 5 plus 6 is 11. 7 plus 8 is 15. Yep. So that sum is 36. Notice how they give different results, and it's a very, very, very rare situation where everything 
where they're the same thing. They're not necessarily the same. You can't treat them as the same. Okay, so maybe that would be a different example. I whack that. Well, let's put this under here. Let's back together. Let's make it small. Like that. Okay, so now these are the building blocks for which when it comes to correlation and linear regression, I'm going to show you a bunch of stuff. It's going to get quite confusing in terms of sum summations of x's, summations of y's. But then at the end of it, you can have a nice table where I say the uh, regression line equation is going to be like this, and the correlation equation is going to be like this. And I'm going to be pointing it back in terms of SXX, SYY, and XYY. Okay, so let's talk about... Uh, regression, let's get that one first. So regression. Why is the regression uh, equation like it is? Okay, so I want to attribute this as y equals a plus b lots of x. What that means is, is if I've got a bunch of data points, then for any given value of x, I can interpret what y is. Notice that it's this way around. x is the input and y is the output. You shouldn't really, you shouldn't really use this to estimate um, an x value for a y value. It should really be for only uh, getting an x and outputting a y. Okay. Uh, now, at Excel and various other exam boards uh, don't really care about that point, and they just want you to output stuff. And to be honest, on the surface of it, you know, it shouldn't make a difference. However, by me defining how we're going to get the linear regression, you'll realize that we're looking at as the output of y and how we've actually created uh, the regression equation. It's, it kind of depends on the output of y a little bit. So, um, for the purpose of this, um, let's say I've copied my diagram over here. Do, 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 save some time. Okay, so here it is. Let's make it smaller. Okay, so same deal. I've got my data points. There's n of them. I don't really care what they are. Uh, all I know is that Given a set of data points, I can find the average point, which is that black cross with a circle. That's the average. And for a particular data point, um, we'll call it xi, yi, where i can be any value from 1 to n. Now, let's suppose that this regression line does exist. Now, if this regression line does exist, it necessarily has to go through the mean. And you need to convince yourselves why that is the case. Uh, the average data point should also be on the line of best fit. Um, that should hopefully just make sense. Uh, otherwise, it wouldn't even be a particularly good line of best fit, would it? Okay, now here's what we're going to do. Now, what we want is C R random data point that we've chosen, x i, y i. There is a difference in y coordinate for a given x that this point is away from the y coordinate. Now, this is what we're going to call the error. Okay, and what is that error? Well, it's the difference in coordinates, isn't it? Now, for it to be on this line, it's a y value. Notice it's not y i y1, y2, y3, y4, y5, and so on. This is not a data point, this is a value. So that error is going to be y minus the um, no, sorry, it's going to be yi, the data point, minus what y is, which is a plus bx. So a plus bx here. Uh, if we expand this, this is going to be yi minus a minus bx. Now, what do we want to do? Well, we want to minimize 
the error. Okay, that's that's the the thing we're looking for, isn't it? Really. Okay. Now, how do we do that? Well, we want to not only minimize the error, we want to minimize the total error. Okay. So all these distances that these different uh, points are from the line, and we're only looking at the y distances, and that's kind of why I said, well, you know, we're by the construction, we're we're keeping x as a fixed, and it's y we're changing. I mean, if you wanted to do a regression line um, from an x perspective, then you'd, you'd flip this all over and we'd be looking at horizontal distances, but we're not going to do that, we're just going to be looking at y. Then to minimize the total error, then we want this, this total error to be as close to zero as possible, right? I mean, it won't actually be zero unless this is a perfect um, straight line, uh, but it, we want it to be as close to zero as possible. Now, the total error would be if we summed up from 1 to n of all of these y i's uh, and this yeah uh, minus a minus b x's like that okay um, now I should really have made that x i like that there you go for a given input of x, if we do that to it, it should spit out a y. Yes, okay. So the error, the sum of the errors should be this. We'll call e for errors. Now here's the problem. It may be that all of these errors that are above, oh dear, it may be that all of these errors that are above, uh, oops, that are above the line, the sum of those errors, which may be positive, for example, the way we've constructed it, uh, they may cancel out with all these errors under the line. So it may just be by some fluke that all the distances above the line equal all the negative distance below the line, so that the sum equals to zero. And we don't want that. So really what we want to minimize is this squared distance, right? Because when you square uh, a real number that either be zero or positive. Now in that case the error will only be zero if every single one of the distances is zero. So really we want to minimize this. Okay so this is what we want. We want to minimize this thing and by minimizing this we're actually going to solve for a and b. Now going back to calculus what do we want to do? we want to minimize e with respect to a and with respect to b okay we want to know how e changes as you fiddle with a and b right so what we want is we want to solve d e by d a and d e by d b like so okay and we want to find the minimums so we set these equal to zero Okay, now we've done enough calculus to know how to do this kind of stuff. The problem is, though, is that what I haven't showed you quite yet, and you're going to see later on, is that d by dx of a variable of a function f is when a function only depends on one variable. Okay, now later on in the course, when we look at different calculus, we're going to be looking where functions depend on multiple variables and so on, right? So x, y, z, anything else you want to plug in there, like temperature and so on. This is what we mean by multi-variable calculus. And now the rules slightly change here, although not by much, because what we're going to do now is to denote that we're dealing with multivariable calculus, if I wanted to differentiate f with respect to x, it would be a curly f with respect to x, like so on. So technically, I've made a deliberate mistake to show you that this should be curly de by curly db, and this should be curly de by curly da. 
and all that it behaves exactly in the same way we're still differentiating we're still doing the stuff we've done so far the only difference is is that the curly D's just remind us that E in this case E is technically a function of Y I X I A and B it's got four different parameters to solve for so this is a multi-variable function so we're going to have to use multivariable calculus instead of just differentiating with respect to one thing. And it's really easy to differentiate to differentiate you just treat uh, the other variables as constants. That's all you have to do. So when you're differentiating with respect to one variable, you treat all the other variables as constants and differentiate in the normal way. Okay, sounds difficult, but hopefully you can keep up with this. Now we've done enough calculus to know how to differentiate things. We know how to use the chain rule by now, if you've been watching the calculus video with the chain rule. So now we've actually got enough to do this. We've got enough skills to do this. So, we need to differentiate E with respect to A and set it equal to zero. Right, let's do that. So over here. So first thing we're going to do is first differentiate E with respect to A and set it equal to zero. So how do we differentiate the sum of this thing? Well, it's still going to be a sum from 1 to n, but now I just differentiate the stuff inside. So differentiate with respect to a, um, yi minus a minus b x i, and then that's squared. Okay, so by the chain rule, if I want to differentiate this stuff with respect to a, then you take the argument, because this is a function of a function, right? Essentially, you can call this function g, and essentially g is a function of a, which is a function, well, g is a function of a, well, yeah, g is a function of a. And if you want to, and if e is a function of g, which is a function of a, then to, to find de by da, I need to do de by dg. Well, if e is the sum from 1 to n of g squared, and g is well it's y minus a minus b x i this is a y i then to differentiate g squared with respect to g that just becomes 2g and to differentiate this with respect to a um, y is a constant so that goes b and x i are constant so that goes and minus a will differentiate to minus one so in actual fact well this will be the sum from 1 to n 2g so all we have to do is multiply this by this. So actually, uh, the differentiation of E with respect to A, taking the partial derivative, set and equal to zero, equals minus one lots of the sum from one to N of two lots of G, which is YI minus A minus B X I. Um, other points to note, this is a constant factor 2, so I can take this 2 out as a factor. Uh, why is that the case? Well, let's suppose I've got the sum of all the numbers from 1, um, let's say I've got the sum of the numbers 2, 4, 6, 8. Which, and that is the, another way of saying I've got the sum of 2i, where i goes from 1 to 4. Right? 2 plus 4 plus 6 plus 8 is clearly 20. And if I take the 2 out as a factor, this is 2 lots of the sum from i is 1 to 4 of i. See how I've taken that constant factor out. And when i goes from 1 to 4, this is going to be 2 lots of 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4. And you can see that this equals to 10. 2 lots of 10 is 20. That works. You can try different examples um, you know, for yourself. But essentially, if you see a constant factor, you can just take that out. 
So to tidy this up a little bit, it's minus 2, lots of the sum of that thing. So this is an example, but I'll delete. And now look very carefully. If we get rid of this, we've got 0 equals this thing. I can divide by minus 2 both sides. So now I will have the sum of yi minus a minus bxi has to equal to 0. And that shouldn't really come as a surprise because what we're trying to say is that the errors should equal to 0. Now, again, that's not particularly difficult, but the trick here is that we're going to get one equation, two equations, and there are one, two unknowns. And I've said before in the simultaneous equations and inequalities videos that I've done, if you've got two unknowns, you're going to need to have two equations in order to solve this. So we're going to have to do the same kind of thing for the differentiation of E with respect to B, set this equal to zero. And now that is the sum from 1 to n of the partial derivative with respect to B of this function yi minus a minus bxi and this is all squared. Okay, same deal. Um, we've now got, you know, this function we can still call g, but look what happens when we differentiate with respect to b. Um, well, we're, we're going to get that e is still a function of g, which is still a function of b this time. So we need to find dE by dg, which we've already worked out to get. That's the, the sum from 1 to n of 2g. But now we have to multiply this by dg by dB. Now if you look very carefully, the, d, the, the b term is times by xi. So yi would differentiate to 0 because it's just a constant if you keep it fixed. A is a constant if you keep it fixed, but minus B XI, if you differentiate with respect to minus B, is just going to be minus XI. Why is that the case? Well, essentially you've got minus 2B, for example. If XI is a constant, minus 2B would just differentiate to minus 2. So, very interesting now, because when you plug all this together, um, well, in actual fact, I've got the derivative inside the sum, so I don't need this. Um, you're actually going to get 0 equals the sum from 1 to n of, and this was a minus 2, wasn't it? Oh, no, no. I've got the minus there times everything, so I'm going to have negative. I'm going to have 2g, which is going to be yi minus a minus bxi, times by another xi. And that's it. Same deal again. I can take this constant uh, minus 2 out in, as a factor of the front. And since it equals to 0, I can divide both sides by minus 2. And now I've got this. Okay, so may, actually I may probably will need another page. Oops, a daisy. Right, so I now have this set up. Now, it looks a bit clumsy, looks a bit crazy, but I now have to solve this and this. Okay, and you're probably thinking, like, what on earth, how on earth do I solve this kind of thing? Well, both of these have to equal to zero for this to work. So, what actually are they? Well, I've got zero equals the sum from 1 to n, and now what I'm going to do is... Another point of summations is that I can individually break up the sums. For example, if I've got the sum from 1 to n of, say, n, and um, let's, well, let's, say, let's say I've got 2n plus a 2n minus 1, or rather put it the other way around. And you'll see where I'm going with this, 2 minus 1 and 2n. So what would that look like? Well, not n. I don't want n. These are i's. There you go. And let's say we're doing this from 1 to 4. So the first term would be 2 lots of 1 minus 1, which is 1, plus 2 lots of 1, which is 2. 
What would the second term be? Well, two lots, I'd, I'd plug the two into the i's. So two lots of two minus one is three, two lots of two is four. What would the third term be? Two lots of three minus one is five, plus two lots of three is six. And it's the fourth term, two lots of four minus one is seven, plus two lots of four is eight. Now clearly, the sum of all those eight numbers would be the same as the sum oops, from, from 1 up to 4, as all the odd numbers, 2i minus 1, plus the sum from 1 to 4 of all the even numbers. It shouldn't matter how I sum up all of these things as long as I sum them up all together. So, for example, 1 to 8 is essentially written by this sum here. This sum is all the odd numbers, 2i minus 1, so that's 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus 7. And this sum is all the even numbers, so it's going to be 2 plus 4 plus 6 plus 8. Okay, and the, their sums are going to be the same. It's all the numbers from 1 to 8. Why am I saying this? Because I'm now going to attempt to break this up. So it will be the sum of 1 to n of yi minus the sum from 1 to n of a minus the sum from 1 to n of b x i. Now, a couple of other things. Because these two terms are negative, I can add them both to each side. So what would that give? Well, that would essentially be saying that the sum of y i would equal these two sums. And now, since a and b are constants that we try to find, then this a can come out as a factor, so that becomes the sum of 1. And this b can come out as a factor here. Like so. And you're probably thinking, OK, I can get what this is. This is just the sum of x from 1 to n. So x1, x2, plus x3, plus x4, and so on up to xn. And then whatever that result is times it by b. I get what this thing is. That's the sum of all the y values. So y1 plus the y2 plus y3 and so on. But what does it mean to sum up 1 from 1 to n? Well, that's easy. You do 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus and so on, and then finally plus 1, where you have done this process n times. What does it mean to add 1 to itself n times? That's just going to be n. So when I times that by a, this term is just going to equal a n. So I've got the sum of y i, when i goes from 1 to n, equals a times n plus b lots of the sum from 1 to n of xi. This glorious thing I'm going to call equation 1, and that is one of our simultaneous equations that we're going to use. Right, so I've used this one. I'm now going to look at this one. So same deal. I'm going to expand the brackets first because it's technically all of this thing that's being summed. So I've got yi times xi, so that is the sum of, let's do it alphabetically, xi times yi. And then I've got minus a times xi, well I'm going to have minus the sum, and this is again, this is going to get rather tedious to keep going from i equals 1 to n, so if I just write sigma on its own and I've left it blank, that's what I mean. This is going to be minus a xi, and then I'm going to have minus the sum from 1 to n of b, and then I've done xy times xy, so it's xi squared. And this whole thing equals to 0 still. And similar reason, I've got these two negatives, so I might as well get to the other side to make the positive. So this equals this. For similar reasons, a and b are both positive, well they're just constants, so I'll take them out and put them in front, like so. And if I just whack this thing down, like so, let's make this a bit bigger, that is 
my second equation. And now, believe it or not, I am ready to solve. Holy hell, you're thinking, what on earth is this? How on earth do I solve this? Well, okay. Maybe, to make things a little bit easier, how about we do the following? Okay, let's say, um, well, let's color code this. Okay, let's say that this thing, the sum of all the y's, let's call that um, capital Y. Okay, and let's shade it green so we know what we're talking about. Let's say that the sum of all the x's, now I'm just making these letters up by the way, don't you know, don't get your knickers in a twist. You're like, oh, he's defining things, what's going on? Then the sum of xi, let's call this capital X for no reason. Then this is x and we've got one here and we've got one here, look. Now let's, um, I don't know, there's one more, isn't it? There's, the, there's two more, actually. There's this one here. Let's write that like that. And then let's shade this, I don't know, blue. And let's call x, y like this. Um, hmm. Let's call this z. Okay, now let's, let's get one thing clear, right? Now, I've said this before. The sum of x, y is not the same as the sum of x times by the sum of y. Okay, and the reason why I've given it a different letter z is because you might think, oh, well, if I've ever got an x times a y, then that equals to z. That's not true. This is saying the sum of x times by the sum of y is the same as the sum of x, y. And hopefully I've gone through an example of that. I must have done. I've forgotten now. Is it over here somewhere? Yeah, they're not the same. So I've given them a different letter, so that Z instead of X, Y, so that you don't, so when we start multiplying things, you're not gonna get you know, your knickers in a twist. And then similarly, I'm gonna call this thing here the sum of X squared, over here. Um, for no particular reason, um, let's call this alpha. Let's shade this a different color. Let's give it pink. Okay. Now, if we translate all this stuff, what does that mean? It means we've got capital Y equals A N plus B lots of capital X. And then we've got Z equals A lots of X plus B lots of alpha. Right, now hopefully, if we can solve for A and B in terms of X, Y, Z, and alpha, then all we have to do is sub back in the sub summations and everything will be fine. Okay, so for no particular reason, I am going to try and eliminate A. So do you get, if I take the top equation and times it by capital X, and I take the bottom equation and times it by N, then I'm going to get A N capital X in both lines, i.e. the top equation becomes Y times by X, and this equals A N X plus B X squared, and the second line becomes Z times N equals A N X plus B N alpha. Right. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is subtract one line from the other. So these two will cancel because they're the same. I'm going to get Y capital X minus Z times N equals, they cancel, and then look, I'm going to get B lots of capital X squared plus N times alpha. And now clearly B 
equals y times x minus zn over x squared plus n alpha. Right. Now, let's go back to our key and figure out what all this means and see if we can simplify it. Now, I'm sorry this is long-winded, but, you know, if you want to skip all this stuff, I'll put a timestamp of where the formulas are and you can just skip to that. Um, I really, really, really don't like just teaching people stuff and going, yeah, yeah, it's just this, take my word for it. I kind of, I like proving things. Um, and I think if you take math seriously, then you always want to delve a bit deeper. And all the maths you do know, you're going to have to understand where it comes from, why it's, it is. Um, and, and to be honest, quite a lot of maths, uh, you don't have to know that much to really delve into it. Now, there's some, you know, philosophical things where you do, but um, up until at least A-level, there's a few things. I, I feel anyway. I mean, I could be wrong. So, what have we got here? We've got B equals Y times X. So, these two things time together. So, you've got the sum of X times by the sum of y, and these are both from 1 to n, and then minus z times n. So you've got n times by the sum of x times yi, like that. Okay, and then this is all over x squared, which is the sum of xi from 1 to n all squared uh, plus um, do, 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 do. have I done this right? Oh, I swear I'm supposed to no, I've subtracted them you silly billy uh, that minus that, so b so that should be a minus Sols. that should be a minus that should be a minus uh, that should be a minus n times alpha, so that's n times this thing, so that's n times by the sum of xi squared from 1 to n. Okay, now there's a curtain roll here because with a little bit of manipulation, do you remember those things I asked you to memorize, these things? We are now going to get B in terms of those things, right? But we have to do a little manipulation. For a start, can you see how there's nothing times by N here? It's always the sum or the sum divided by N. Now, because I've got a fraction here, I can divide everything by N, top and bottom, and that should be fine. So this is the same as... I lower this down a little bit. If I divide by n top and bottom, this n disappears and this all goes over n. And then similarly, this disappears and this goes over n. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply everything top and bottom by minus 1 to get b equals the sum of xi yi minus the sum of x, the sum, that is a terrible sigma, sum of y over n, and this is between 1 and n, 1 and n, 1 and n, and this is all over um, the sum of xi squared, whoops, all of it squared, over n, minus, oh, I've times it by minus 1, haven't I, silly boy, uh, this is going to be the sum of xi squared minus the sum of xi all squared over n, between 1 to n, 1 to n, and so on. Now, look at this. Look what this is. Look what this is. If I whack this up here, can you spot what's going on here? I've got the sum of xy minus the sum of x times sum of y over n. Well, that's, the, that's sxy, isn't it? That's exactly that. And it's being divided 
by the sum of x squared minus the sum of x all squared over n, well that's this thing. Wicked. So, let's take it back. Clearly, b is just going to be s x y over s x x. This little nugget, really easy to remember. Now, I don't remember all of this stuff, and to be honest, working through it just now is dragging up years of university stuff from easily over a decade ago. But the, the point is, um, how do I remember this? Well, I almost treat it as, well, let's, let's, let's remember what the thing is. The, the regression line was y equals a plus bx. b is the gradient. What is the gradient to me? Well, it's the change in y over change in x. You've got y over x here. And because x is the variable that we're trying to make it explainable, then this is the x here. So if I wanted it so that I could use y's to interpret x's, then I'd have to do s y y over s y s y x over s y y. I just flip all the x's and y's over. Um, it's up to you how you memorize it. Uh, it used to be in the formula sheet, and the sad thing is, is that these calculations aren't in A level maths anymore. Um, so, yeah, let's 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 take this. This is the main thing. Being able to calculate b, absolutely essential. Uh, unfortunately, you don't need to do this anymore because in the new A level specification. Uh, your calculator has just spit it out for you. Uh, I think it's a terrible idea. I think students need to understand where the calculations came from, why they work, and I think when you have that uh, basis, you can just, you know, you can figure these things out. Um, now, you're probably thinking, hold on a minute, there was two simultaneous equations, and you've only solved for one variable. Now, actually, let's go back up here. To find A is actually really easy. Now, you could, if you wanted to, back substitute it in to the two equations we found. Right, you could do it that way. It might take a little while. I mean, you could. I wouldn't recommend it. What I would do is I know that A is such that A is such that, well, think about it. I know one point that's on the line, right? What point do I know? I know that x bar and y bar are on the line. I defined that line of best fit to go through there. So if I've, that means y bar should equal a plus b lots of x bar. So if I know what x bar and y bar are and I know what b is now, then I can just make a the subject. So y bar minus b x bar is just what a is. And now that I've got these two bits of information, I can actually work out. Um, I can I can work out uh, a line of best fit, you know, and it's, it's the least squares regression line, because I'm trying to minimise from this step over here the squares of the errors, um, and it checks out. You know, this is this is fairly uh, rigorous. Uh, you might find a few YouTube videos online, but I'm hoping this is fairly unique. Um, so, uh, an example of this. Well, okay. So, I don't know, e.g. E.g. How, 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 would, how would this look? Um, okay, let's suppose I've got my data. Uh, it's all over the place, like this. And, I don't know, it's fairly positive or whatever. I, I don't know. I don't even know. So let's suppose I've got data all over the place, um, and I've got the following. I've got, the, I've got n is 20. I've got the sum of all the x's is, say, I don't know, 400. Uh, let's say 4,050. Let's say sum of all the y's is, um, I don't know, 5,200. Um, let's suppose. You've done all the calculations and you found out the sum of all the x's times the y's, which, oh, I don't know. Um, well, I'll I, I tell you what, let's, let's, let's make up some data and see how it works. 
okay let's say this point is one one let's say this point is one five let's say this point is two six let's say this point is four comma three let's say this point is five comma seven let's say this point is six comma eight and let's say this point here is seven comma six so there's not actually 20 data points. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's seven data points. So what would the sum of all the x's be? Well, you just sum all the x's up. So one, two, uh, that's two plus four, eight, uh, plus five is 13, plus six is 19, plus seven is 26. So the sum of all the x's are 26. The sum of all the y's, well, that's quite easy. Uh, 1 plus 5 is 6, plus 6 is 12, plus 3 is 15, um, plus 7 is 22, plus 8 is 30, plus that's 36. Okay, what would the sum of x squareds be? We need to know all this stuff. So 1 squared plus 1 squared is 2, plus 2 squared um, is 4. Plus 4 squared is 16, plus 5 squared is 25, plus 6 squared is 36, plus 7 squared is 49. Uh, I have the 2 originally. I make that the sum of x squared is 132. The sum of y squared is when I square all the y values. So 1 plus 25 plus 36 plus 9 plus 49 plus 64. So I make all the y squareds 220. And then finally, I need the sum of x y's uh, so x times y so the first one the bottom left is 1 times 1 then I've got 1 times 5 which is 5 and then I've got 2 times 6 which is 12 4 times 3 is another 12 5 times 7 is 35 6 times 8 is 48 plus 7 times 6 is 42 so that will be 155 um, okay so another few stats you can calculate x bar is just going to be the sum of x over n so 26 over 7 uh, to one decimal, uh, two decimal places, 3.71. And y bar is the sum of y uh, over 7, so 36 over n, so that's going to be 5.14. Okay, we now actually have enough information to calculate uh, the regression line because it's the sum of x, y. So it's going to, so, so b for the y equals a plus bx usually calculate b first, so b will be the sum of x, y, which is the sum of x times y minus uh, sum of x times sum of y over n, all over uh, s double x, which is the sum of x squared minus the sum of x all squared over n. And now I've actually got all my bits here, so the sum of x, y is 155 minus the sum of x, which is 26, times by the sum of y, which is 36, over n, which is 7. And this is all over the sum of x squared, which is 132, minus the sum of x, which is 26, all squared, over n, which is 7. I bang that into a calculator, so fraction 155 minus fraction uh, 26 times 36 over 7, over 132 minus fraction, and this is 26 squared over 7. So apparently the B value to two decimal places is 0 0.60. So this line of best fit, which is going up like that, apparently has a gradient of 0 0.6. So that's a fairly shallow gradient, but never mind. And to get the A value, to get the A value, remember that's just Y bar minus B lots of X bar. So A is going to be Y bar which is 5.14 minus b, which is now 0 0.60, times y x bar, which is 3.71. So 5.14 minus 0 0.60 times 3 points. Uh, so a is going to be 2.914. So that means that the line of best fit is going to be y equals uh, a. Well, let's, do, let's get it in terms of mx plus c. It's going to be 0 0.6x plus 2.914. Okay, so the line that minimizes the error from each data point to the line in the y direction and that also goes through the average point, which is x bar, y bar, can be committed as that. So in actual fact, 
Uh, this is going to be a line that's probably going to be looking more like that, where it's going to cross the y-axis here at 2.914. So, say for example, uh, this was the t this was a test on seven kids, for example, and there's an eighth kid who's who is absent, and the eighth kid who turns up does one of the tests. Let's say he does the x test and gets an answer of three then what would his y value be as an estimate? Well, I just substitute 3 into here for the x and I find out. So 0 0.6 times 3 plus 2.914. So you'd expect that kid to get around 4.714. Um, yeah, on average. So regression lines, lines of best fit can be done that way. Hopefully that was fairly informative. Um, we've still got correlation to go. Um, yeah, that's going to be tricky to explain, but I'll, I'll give it my best shot. So let's create a new page. So hopefully that's given you an idea of regression, uh, how to get an actual line of best fit, um, no messing about, and hopefully the rationale was there. Now, okay. Um, what are we doing now? Correlation, that's it. And what colour did we use? Pink. Right, okay. So, okay, correlation. How do we... Um, okay, so just like um, regression lines, uh, up till GCSE, when a question asks you to draw a line of best fit, uh, you kind of just eyeball it and you go, well, okay, yeah, it kind of seems legit, whatever. Uh, it's a good enough line of best fit. And then you get all kinds of problems like, you know, somebody's line of best fit might not agree with somebody else's line of best fit. Um, yeah, all kinds of errors popping out. Um, it's up for debate, which it really shouldn't be. Um, you know, but that's, that's pretty much it. So just in the same way, just in the same way that um, regression lines using the least squared methods for the errors uh, have now narrowed down uh, a form in which we're going to find uh, the line of best fit. Uh, correlation, find product moment correlation coefficient is going to be another way of trying to quantify this whole oh well the, the graph is a positive, strong positive, weak positive. Well no, you can, we're actually going to quantify it on a scale from minus one to one. Um, so let's let's um, let's deal with this. So first of all, we've, we've got our data set again. Same rules. X, the black X uh, circled is the mean uh, point which has coordinates x bar comma y bar, um, and this data is is as such. What we're going to do, okay, is we're going to introduce this idea called covariance, okay. And the covariance we're going to define as the sum of x minus, sorry, um, yeah, xi minus x bar times by yi minus y bar, like so. And yeah, we, we're going to divide that by n. So let's let's talk about the rationale of why this is happening. So let's imagine that you can probably guess what that stuff up there is meaning, but let's let's suppose you don't. Let's suppose I split this data up into four, like so. And the reason why I'm doing so is because now about the mean point, we've got the following. Do you agree? that if there's, there's, there's four quadrants here about the mean point, let's say this is quadrant one up here, and I'll do this in orange. This is quadrant one up here. Then anti-clockwise going around, this is quadrant two, this is quadrant three, this is quadrant four. Do you agree that if the data is mostly in quadrants one and three, then this is a positive correlation? Why? Because if I was to draw a line of best fit and have it going through those two quadrants, this is clearly a positive correlation. Conversely, if the data points were mostly in quadrants two and four, 
we would de we would describe this as a negative correlation. Do you get how because most of the points are in quadrant one and quadrant three, that is quite a good quantifiable method of saying, well, this appears to be a positive correlation, right? There are still some points in quadrants two and four, but if those points didn't exist, right, then really mostly being in quadrant one and three would be an even stronger positive correlation. Now here's the deal. What is what is this quantity xi minus x bar? Well, that is the average distance in the x direction for each point from the mean. So say this purple line is the line with equation x equals x bar. Then the horizontal distance from this point to the bar would be there. And that would be that distance, 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 and so on and so on. Let's just take one of them, for example. Well, let's take one from each quadrant. Let's say one and two. Now, do you agree, if I was to find the distance from there to there, this equation says the x-coordinate minus the mean. Do you agree that this would give a positive value? For example, if this was x equals 6 and this had an x-coordinate of 7 maybe, then this distance would be 1, which is a positive number. Do you also agree that any x value on this side will give a positive xi minus x bar? Do you agree with that? So clearly this side will give xi minus x bar as a positive value. And on this side, what will happen? Well, just as you expect from here to here, then xi minus x bar would give a negative value. Okay. Oops. Let's get this right. Okay. Can, can you see why that would be the case? Okay. Now we're going to have a look at this second thing over here. What does it mean yi minus y bar? Well, those are going to be the vertical distances from each point to where x, to where the mean point is. So if I look at it another way, then that's the vertical distance from the point. That's the vertical distance. That's the vertical distance. That's the ver I could do this for all the points. But let's take one above and one below to see what's going on. So let's take this one over here. Do you agree that yi minus y bar is going to be positive for everything, for every x value above the mean? Can you see why that's the case? Because all of the, the points above the mean have a greater y value, so that y value minus a lower mean is going to give a positive result. Similarly, all the points below the mean, if I subtract the mean from them, that's going to give a negative result. Ah, now look, look what's happening. We are multiplying these two things together. So what's that going to end up with? Well, look what happens. If I want a positive correlation, then, that, then when I multiply two things together, then that means I've multiplied a positive with a positive or a negative with a negative. Now look, where is this positive? It's positive here and here, so that means it must live in this section, or when we're dealing with a negative and a negative, we're in this region here. Do you agree that in both of those regions, we're either multiplying a positive by positive in the top right, or a negative by a negative in the bottom left? And either way, that's going to result in a positive result, which is what we'd expect for a positive correlation. That's good. Now, similarly, 
If I was anticipating a negative value for this in, in an attempt to calculate our correlation, then that would either come from a positive times a negative or a negative times a positive. And by a similar argument, that's either we're going to have a negative x and positive y, which is up there, or a positive x and a negative y, which is down there. Now, if the, the data was mostly in those bits, the sum of all the errors were mostly in that region, then it would be a negative correlation. Okay. Now, hopefully that has given you motivation of why. And, and obviously, we're dividing by n because it, essentially we're taking the errors in the x and y component and we're dividing them by the number of endpoints. So we're getting like an average for the data points. Now, unfortunately, this covariance, covariance could be anything. For example, if x's and y's and y's and x's were just super huge or super small, this doesn't necessarily guarantee that our correlation is between minus 1 and 1 like we wanted. So this is what you'd, you'd kind of call as like an intermediate step. And now, here's, here's the kicker. Now, we, we talked about this in mechanics, but we're talking about units. Now, the units of this thing, it would be in X's, whatever the X is, kilograms, meters, centimeters, whatever. And the units of this part would be Y's, whatever Y's in, centimeters, seconds, whatever. It honestly doesn't matter. Whereas, look very carefully, this PMCC, this correlation coefficient, is dimensionless. It has no units. Yet somehow this covariance thing has units. The units are whatever x is times y. So for example, uh, if x was in kilograms and y was in seconds, then the covariance as units would have been kilograms seconds. For example, you know, e.g. So if the dimensions of x were kilograms and the dimensions of y were in seconds, then the covariance of x and y, written like that, the dimensions of that would be kilograms seconds. Okay, now the covariance itself, not particularly useful, uh, it kind of is. Uh, it's a good quick calculation to see if there is a positive or negative um, correlation, but it doesn't really give much more than that. It's just a, it's an intermediate tool. Um, now, what we want to do, what we really want to do, is we want to normalize it so this thing spits out, so this thing spits out um, our product moment correlation coefficient. And there's various ways of calculating uh, correlation, but this is like the standardish one. So we've got a little formula that depending on where the data is with respect to the mean, either spits out a positive value if most of them are to the top right or to the bottom left, and spits out a negative value to the top if they're mostly to the top left or bottom right, which is good. Now let's let's cut to the chase. The Let's do it pink. I did say pink. So the PMCC, the product moment correlation coefficient, which we'll denote as R, but you could denote it as rho. And rho is this kind of like slanty P type thing. Uh, it's pronounced rho, R-H-O, rho, 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 your boat, but not R-O-W. Then this is nothing but the covariance of x, y, all divided by the standard deviation of x times the standard deviation of y. Now, why do you think that's the case? Well, for a start, dimensions-wise, this works out. Because the covariance of x, y would be whatever the dimensions of x are times the dimensions of y, and the standard deviation of x would be the dimensions of x, and the standard deviation of y would be the dimensions of y. These would cancel, these would cancel, and you're left with a constant number. Fine. But why would it, why would it necessarily um, spit out uh, 
a number between 0 and 1? Well, uh, between minus 1 and 1. Well, let's think about that. What were to happen... What were to happen if... If... Um, the... Oh, what am I saying? Well, what were to happen if the data points were all lined up in a straight line, like so. Then, think about it, the top would be the sum of xi minus x bar times by the sum of yi minus y bar. This would all be over n. And now the standard deviation of x if you think about it, is the square root of the sum of x i minus x bar squared over n. And the sum, the standard deviation of y would be the sum of y i minus y bar squared over n. Now, carefully, the over n times over n with thirds will just become over n squared. The square root of n squared is n. That would cancel with that n. And now, you've got the sum of xi minus the sum of x bar on the top times the sum of yi minus y bar on the top. And then this is all over the sum of xi minus x bar squared square rooted times by a square root uh, sum y bar minus y. Um, stuff's going to cancel down to 1 or minus 1. Okay, can you see how depending whether you take the positive or square root, these will cancel, these will cancel, and you're going to be left with a 1 or minus 1. Okay, if the, the inputs were perfectly matching... Oh no, what have I done here? Yeah, if the inputs were perfectly matching the in a straight line then everything would cancel top and bottom and you'd be left with plus or minus one um, which is which is great you know it's what you wanted so you're probably thinking okay um, hold on a minute you said that you were going to give me r in terms of this thing up here in terms of sxx's syy's sxy's and all that stuff well, I'm going to give it to you now. R is the same as SXY over the square root of SYY times by SXX. Bingo. Now, can you see why that's the case? Well, the sum of XY is going to be the sum of x y x i y i between one and n minus the sum of x sum of y from one to n one to n x i and this is all over n and then this is all over the square root of sum of y y so that's the sum of y squared between one and n minus uh, the sum of y all squared over n times by the sum of x squared minus the sum of x all squared over n. Um, and then how does this relate? Well, let's, let's expand the bottom and see what we get. Well, you're going to multiply these two things. So it will be... Uh, It will be the sum of x squared, the sum of y squared. Um, then you're going to have uh, this times this. So, ah, so you're going to have the sum of y all squared over n times by the sum of x squared. And then you're going to have minus sum of x all squared over n times by y squared. And then you're going to have plus um, 
all those two things times together. So sine y squared times by the sum of x all squared over n times m, which is n squared. Um, right. So what's 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 cracking here? Well, let's deal with this. Um, well. No, I don't have to make this confusing. This is all. This is already done. Um, I mean, that is the. Right. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Well, that is. That's right, I think I have. Yeah. Oh, have I not copied this down correctly? Yeah, no, I must have. Okay, so let's try and fudge the bottom. Um, right, so hold on, for a start, uh, where's my standard deviations? It's up here. Uh, let's try and link the standard deviations in terms of SXX and XXY. So I think that would probably be easier to sort out. So the standard deviation of X is the sum of X minus X bar squared, and then this is over N, and then this is square rooted. Um, X minus X bar is going to be X squared minus... Um, x times x bar and then two lots of that plus x bar all squared. This is the sum of this over n, all square rooted. So it's going to be the sum of x squared minus two lots of x bar sum of x, right, because these are all x size, so they need to be summed, um, plus um, the sum of x bar all squared is just going to be x bar n times. That's so going to be n x squared, x bar squared. And this is all over n still. Um, now, x bar, x bar is the sum of x over n. So when I put that into there like that, uh, I want to get, do I want to get these x bars? I think I do. Yeah, then this becomes the sum, that is a terrible sigma, sum of x squared minus two lots of the sum of x i squared over n, because I've got a sum of x times sum of x all over n, plus and then x bar squared is this thing squared, which is going to be sum of x all squared over n squared, and when I times it by n, that's going to be sum of x all squared over n. Um, do, 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 do. Is this right? Yeah. And then, so this is going to tidy up. And then this is all over n, and this is square rooted. And then this is going to be the sum of x squared minus the sum of x all squared over n. And then this is all divided by n square rooted. And so that top bit is just the square root of SXX over N. So that's the standard, deep. yeah, okay, bosh. Um, fine. So going back, so okay, the standard deviation of X is just SXX over N. So the standard deviation of Y is just the square root of SYY over N by symmetry. That's useful to know. So going back to here, um, then what I've got is on the top, um, well actually on the bottom, looking at this thing, I've got, if I make, um, so actually 
SXX rooted is the same as root n times by the square root of x. So on the bottom of this fraction, I've got root n times the square root uh, times the standard deviation of x times by the square root of n times the standard deviation of y. And now this and this cancel to just give an n. So the bottom of this is actually uh, n times by sigma x times by sigma y. Um, yes, and the top is SXY. Uh, do, 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 do. Um, oh, I'm going to have to do stuff with this, aren't I? Okay, uh, let's tidy this up then. So let's look at the covariance. So the covariance is 1 over n sigma of x minus x bar times by y minus y bar. Have I done this before? No, I haven't. I can't have done. So expand this. So you're going to get 1 over n. This is the covariance. This is going to be the sum of uh, x times y minus um, x bar y minus y bar x plus x bar y bar. And that's all summed. So really quickly, this is going to be 1 over n, lots of, the sum, that is a terrible sigma, the sum of xy minus, now x bar is just a constant, so I can take that x bar out as a constant, and that will be sum y, minus y bar is a constant, so that can come out, that's sum x, plus, and now the sum of x bar y bar is just going to be x bar y bar n times. Um, okay, sum of xy just stays it is as it is. Uh, x bar is the sum of x over n, so that's going to be sum x times sum y over n. Y bar is the sum of y over n, so when times by sum x, that's just that. Then x bar y bar is sum, that's the sum of x over n times by the sum of y over n, but when we times by n, that and that cancels, so that's going to be plus sum of x, sum of y over n, like so. And this whole thing is over n. Um, so what's going to happen here? That and that cancel, so we're left with this. Um, yeah, so we're going to get... Doop doop. Covariance. Covariance is this. But then what I've actually got on the top, this thing, is actually this. So I've actually got n times the covariance. So I've actually got n times by the covariance of x and y on the top. The n's cancel, and I do indeed have the covariance of xy over sigma x, sigma y. So it did actually work out in the end. Oh boy, uh, I really hope you followed that. Uh, I'm probably going to put a timestamp on it. But the, the, the main takeaway is that the correlation coefficient is this. Uh, the great news is, is your calculator does this all built in. Um, so you do not have to worry about that one step. Um, yeah, so quite advanced uh, statistics. Uh, the books, textbooks, don't actually go over why it is. For good reason. Uh, I've probably given a very amateurish expl explanation of what's going on here. Um, but, you know, the, the, the only thing I would say is that um, technically it gets a little bit more complicated when you're talking about a population versus a sample. Now what I've done here is when we're dealing with the population, let's say n, but with a sample you do a similar calculation, but this time you replace n with n minus 1. And that's got stuff to do with um, biased and unbiased operators, and we'll, we'll get to that at some point. But whenever you see a calculation here, if you want to do it with a sample, then just do n minus 1. Um, so over here, S double X, would, that would be a minus 1, that would be a minus 1, that would be a minus 1, and so on. To be honest, um, it, it does make a difference, 
but I, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Uh, just assume that you're dealing with a population. Um, unless the, the, the question does specify sample and you've got to be really careful. Okay, well enough chat, let's actually do some work. So I'll start off easy and then I'll do a couple of calculations and we'll probably call it a day, it's quite a long video. Um, yeah, so pause the video if you want to give it a go yourself. Um, and yeah. Okay, so let's go, this, go through this. Scatter diagrams below. Um, by a student. Diagram A looks like that. Diagram B looks like that. Diagram C looks like that. The student calculated the value of the PMCC, the product moment correlation coefficient for each of the sets of values. The data, the value was so and so. Write down a reason which value corresponds to which scatter diagram. Okay, well, minus 0.799 belongs to this one because there is a negative correlation here. There appears to be a downward trend like so. 0 0.08 is close to 0, which would correspond to here because this appears to be random or no correlation. And 0 0.68 appears to belong to this graph because there appears to be a positive correlation or a positive trend looking something like that. So this was an A-level question back in the day, uh, 2005 or six, something like that, I can't remember. It's very easy. Um, just more GCSE, just testing what your knowledge of correlation is. So, okay, a metallurgist, well, actually, pause the video, give it a go yourself. Worst case, you're wrong. Okay, a metallurgist measured the length L millimeters of a copper rod at various temperatures and recorded the following results. The results were coded such that X equals T and Y equals the following. Calculate SXY and SXX. You may use the sum of x squared was that, and the sum of x, y was the following. Okay, so what does the coding actually mean? Well, if x equals t, nothing's happened. So x is just going to be the same stuff. However, l, the, the y value is just l minus 2460. Now, why has that been used? Because now if we look at this column we can just get rid of all the two four sixes in front of it like so. That's incredibly useful. So this has actually scaled down the data to be a bit more manageable. Okay, now SXY. SXY is the sum of all the X's times Y's minus the sum of X times the sum of Y over N and the sum of XX is the sum of X squared minus the sum of X all squared over N. Now you've got calculators for all this stuff uh, and in actual fact I'm going to use it now. So if I go to statistics and you want to list stuff, so I'm just going to type it in, so 20.4, uh, 27 .3, 32.1, 39.0, 42.9, 49.7, 58.3, 67.4. And then for my y values, I could calculate this all out, but being really efficient with your calculator is probably going to save you a lot of time here. And in actual fact, um, the Casio FX CG50 and the Casio 991EX calculators are, well, the, the Casio, oh god, I've lost track, uh, 2.03, uh, the Casio. 991EX ones, the YT ones, about 25 30 pounds, relatively cheap. They're going to do quite well for you. Um, however, the Casio FX CG50s can range anywhere from 100 to 130 pounds. I don't really recommend them, uh, apart from maybe further statistics. It's got some nice um, inverse distributions going on in there, which will save you a lot of time. Um, it's also nice to plot graphs and stuff. Um, what do you mean, no data? Okay, uh, I want two variable, no data. Okay, interesting. Uh, one variable. Okay. What's going on here? Um, mm, 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 mm. 
Why does my data not match with their data? I don't want one variable, I want two variable um, set up. is okay um menu stats yep okay uh, option yeah Calc. nope oh dear how do you do calculations with this stuff um distribution maybe no no test Mm -hmm. Graph. Okay, let me just pause this to see where I can find it in my calculator. Yeah, after a quick YouTube tutorial, uh, I'm not really familiar with the FX CG50. Uh, playing around with it though, uh, I've left my CG, I've left my Casio FX 991 EXs at school. Uh, I didn't want to do this by hand, um, but anyway, now I've got it. So. Two variable calcs, so calculate SXY and SXX. So, luckily for me, my calculator spits out um, the following. So, for SXY, I need the sum of XYs, which apparently is 757.467. That's the sum of XYs. Uh, the sum of x squared is given, so that's that done. The sum of x, the sum of x is three three seven point one. The sum of y, uh, which I've got to be sixteen point two eight. So let's see, I've got sum of x y check. I've got sum of x, sum of y, and I've got the sum of x squared check. Oh, that's good. My calculator said this and agreed with the question. Fantastic. So now all I need to do is just do the calculation for it. So SXY is going to be sum of XY, which is 757.46 minus, so 757.46. So this is the sum, this is S of XY minus the sum of x, which is 337.1, times by the sum of y, which is 16.28, and this is all over n, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Okay, so minus fraction 337.1 times by 16.28, all over 8. Apparently, that is 71, not 17, 71 point uh, 468, so I'll put 469. Uh, three significant figures, and for the SXX, I will need the sum of x squared, which is given as 15965.01, and then minus the sum of x squared, which I've got as 337.1 squared, and this is all over 8. So that's easy to work out. 15965.01 minus fraction 337.1 337.1 squared all over 8. So I get that as 1760.458, so 459 to three decimal places. Okay, find the equation of the regression line y on x in the form of y equals a plus bx. Well, I know that it's sxy over sxx is the b, so it's y equals b, so that's going to be 71.469 divided by my just recently previous answer, which will get 0.041 to 3 decimal places x plus a. Uh, the mean of x is going to be 337.1 divided by 8, which is 42.138. And the mean of y is going to be 16.28 uh, divided by 8, which is 2.035. So if I make a the subject, a is y bar, which is 2.035 minus my b, which is 0 0.041 
times by my next bar, which is 42.138. So A is going to equal 2.035 minus 0 0.041 times by 42.138. Looks to be about 0 0.307. So it looks like my regression line appears to be Y equals uh, 0 0.307 plus 0 0.041, lots of X. Okay. Uh, estimate the length of the rod at 40 degrees Celsius. Uh, so, okay, so question. Uh, okay, 40 degrees Celsius. Now, what was it again? T is degrees. Uh, so I need to make x equal to 40. So what is 0 0.5? 307 plus 0 0.041 times by 40. That gives me a y value of 1.947, but remember y was L minus that, so the length is y plus if we work backwards. So I have to add 2460. So uh, estimate the length, it would be 2461. 0.95 and this was in millimeters so that'd be my answer for that okay uh, find an equation for the regression line l on t okay right well what would happen here well hmm there's there's two things i could do either i could go back to the data uh, which, to be fair, I might as well do. So if I go back to Menu, Statistics, and then I replace, well, I just add 2,460 to each data point. So 2461.12, uh, 2461.41, and I do the same for the following. But then I notice something. I'm going to have to do a lot more calculations. Um, do I necessarily want to do that? Is there a quicker way? Um, and let's think about it. Let me just type in all the data. 2462.03. Yeah, 246. Yeah, yeah, this is 2462. Um, this is 2462.69. And then this is 2463.05. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So. What's going to happen? Well, um, hmm. what actually happened? Well, the is the gradient going to change? If I just add an amount, will that change the gradient? No. All the y values get shifted up. So the only thing that's going to change is the length is going to be, well think about it, if all that's happening is everything gets shifted up, right, because if x goes to t doesn't change, but y, to go to get l now, I just add 2,460, 2, so all that's going to do is change the y-intercepts, that's 2,460.307, plus 0.041t. So that would be my new thing there. And to test this out, let's go to my run matrix. Oh dear, right, okay. Duh, 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 duh. Right, so then set 90 into there. So 2460.307 plus 0 0.041 times 90. I get 2463 0.997. Uh, if I check my answer with 40 degrees previously, it should marry up in there. So 2460.307 plus 0 0.041 times by my 40 it gives me 2461.95. So yeah, I've done the right thing. So I know this is correct. Okay, comment on the reliability of your estimate in Part E. Well, the original data set goes from 20.4 to 
and we're trying to use this to estimate for 90 degrees Celsius. So we are extrapolating outside of the data set. We are assuming that this linear relationship, if it does exist and is valid, continues outside the data set and we don't know what's going to happen. For example, this copper rod, and I know copper is, doesn't have a melting point of 90 degrees Celsius, that would be pretty lulls if it did, but never mind, but there might be some kind of uh, accelerated rate of deformation or some other physical... The point is we don't know if the relationship is going to carry on past the data set. So this is extrapolating, so it's not particularly estimate. It's not particularly reliable. It may be, but it might not be. Okay. Crickets make a noise. The pitch, V, in kilohertz of the noise made by a cricket was recorded at 15 different temperatures, T equals C Celsius. The, this date, these data points are summarised below. Okay, find STT, SVV and STV. Okay, STT is going to be the sum of T squared, which is this thing, so 10922.81 minus the sum of t all squared, so 401.3 squared, oops, 401.3 squared, all over the sum, which the number, sorry, is 15. So that's quite easy, that's 186.697, so I'll do that to two decimal places. Uh, SVV, um, is going to be um, the sum of v squared, which is that, so 42.3356, minus uh, the sum of v, all squared, so that's 25.08 squared over the total number, which is 15. Uh, so that's going to be 0 0.401, or 02, oh, I've done it to two decimal places, so I might as well leave it as 0 0.40. And then STV is going to be the sum of TV, which is 677.971, minus the fraction of the sum of T, which is 401.3, times by the sum of V, which is 25.08, all over the number, which is 15. So that's going to be 6.997. So it's two decimal places, that's going to be 7.00. Okay, find the product moment correlation coefficient between T and V. Okay, well that is just going to be STV over the square root of SVV times by STT. I know all that stuff already. So 7.00 over the square root of 186.70 times by 0.4. So that is going to be 0.81 to two decimal places, which is a fairly strong positive correlation. State with reason which variable is the explanatory variable. Okay, the explanatory variable is the independent one. So the pitch and temperatures. So do you think the temperature depends on the pitch? Or do you think the, the, the pitch of these crickets depends on the temperature? I think the pitch depends on the temperature so the temperature is the explanatory um, variable because the pitch of the crickets depends on the temperature, not the other way around. Okay, give a reason to support fitting a regression model of that form to it. Well, having 0 0.81 is a fairly strong positive correlation. Now, if it's a fairly strong positive correlation, then that means this data set is probably distributed like so, where they're quite close to a line. So using a line of best fit actually would be quite decent. So yes, that would be, and this is because this is a strong PMCC uh, close to 1. I mean, having a PMCC that's close to minus 1 would also be good as well. The point is you don't want it to be close to 0. Find the value of A and value of B. Give your answer to three sig figs. Right, B 
is the sum of, in this case, uh, TV over, sorry, not sum, S of TV over. Now, which one was our explanatory variable? It's T, so it would be the it'd be S over TT, right? So it's the similar thing to SXY over SXX. X is our explanatory variable, so it would be STT in this case. So STV we've worked out to be 7.00 over STT, which we've worked out to be 186.7. So that's fairly easy to do. That's 7 over 186.7. Uh, so that's going to be 0.037 to 3 sig figs. So then A is going to be the mean of the other variable, the dependent variable, which is now uh, v. So the mean of v is 25.08 over 15 minus b, which is 0 0.037 times by the mean of t, which is 401.3 over 15. So B is 0 0.037 and A is going to be 25.08 over 15 minus 0 0.037 times by fraction 401.3 over 15. Ah, so A to three significant figures is 0 0.682. Okay, using this model, predict the pitch of the noise at 19 degrees Celsius. Okay, so let's remind ourselves what's going on here. So V equals A, which is 0 0.682, plus B, which is 0.037T. Uh, so at 19 degrees Celsius, I've got V equals, so at T equals 19, we have got V equals 0 0.682 plus 0 0.037, uh, sorry, times by 19 we will get V is 1.385. So 1.385 kilohertz, or 1,385 hertz. Yeah. Have I got one more? No, I haven't. Okay, guys, yeah, that was a particularly long video. There's lots of stuff to cover. Um, I've given you some exercises. I'm more than happy to help. But the calculations are fairly straightforward. I just wanted to spend an extra long time just talking to you why these calculations are a thing. All right, toodaloo, bye.